Good morning. I want to say a huge thank you to uh, those that came out yesterday and, and baked cookies and prepped the plates. Um, I think next year we need to ask for 50 dozen cookies instead of 100 because we got close to 200. And my wife brought some of them home. It was awful. It was terrible. I think I ate three different kinds of chocolate chip cookie. Um, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open up to Leviticus chapter 23. We are working through a series on the feasts, and we've spent uh, two weeks now, the first week we kind of went over a general overview of the feasts. We talked about why this is important for us to know. I want to touch on that just really quickly. Why should we care about the feasts? Isn't that an Old Testament thing? Yes and no. We got to remember that everything that was instituted in the Old Testament in the Hebrew Bible was a foreshadow of things to come. It was setting up the New Testament. It's, it's the foundation upon which the New Testament stands. It gives us the understanding of why a Messiah was needed. We see an echo, a completion, a fulfillment, or a furtherance of everything in the Hebrew Bible in the New Testament. Okay? Sometimes we see something that was written and we see it fulfilled in the Gospels or in the book of Acts. We see some things that were fulfilled that or, or were spoken that won't be fulfilled yet until everything is accomplished. We see that echoed in Revelation. So why is it important for us to know? Because it came from somewhere. The New Testament just didn't spring into existence on the breath of wind. And there it was. God has been speaking to and through His creation from the beginning. Okay? And if you are one of those Christians, like I was, that, that were indoctrinated in a New Testament only type of theology, you've only got half the picture. And you're missing a lot of how God reveals Himself how he describes himself and who he is if you ignore the Hebrew Bible. Okay? So why is it important that we look at the feasts? Because I believe in establishing the feasts, God was painting a picture. He was fleshing in a, a, an illustration of his great song of salvation. Of his great plan for mankind. Okay? And, and we started looking in, in Leviticus 23. That's where God lays out to Moses. And Moses in turn lays out to the people the, the six feasts and the Sabbath. Okay, so we have the Sabbath being the first. And we're going to wrap that section up today. Uh, and then we move into the spring feasts. Can anybody tell me what the spring feasts are? Passover. Passover. Unleavened bread. We, yeah, one or two. It, some people say it's the same. Some people say it's two different ones. I, I think they're the same because it goes straight in. Okay? Um, so the Passover and, and the leavened bread being one feast. Okay? The second one? First fruits. It's what we celebrate as Easter or Resurrection Sunday. The first fruits of the dead is how Jesus is described after his resurrection. First fruits. And then the third one. Pentecost. Pentecost. 50 days. And that's the, the, the day that the church gathered together. We believe that they were gathering together in, in the temple, probably on the southern steps, because when they spoke and, and everybody was giving utterance and people heard it in their own native language, there was a crowd of people around there. And then when Peter gives his his sermon and he says be baptized they were right there on the southern steps where all the mikvahs were I mean 
You, people say, oh, they were still in the upper room. No, the, the word for upper room that's being used here, the, the play from chapter 1 to chapter 2, actually indicates they were in a common meeting area. We know from other examples in the Gospels and in Acts that the common meeting area that the disciples were meeting at was the temple. Okay? And it makes sense that, that Peter would tell 3,000 converts to be baptized right there where all the mikvahs were. You've got to keep in mind, these were the ceremonial baths that the, the, the Jews would go down into and wash and come up out of so they could go right into the temple. And they would be ritually purified. Okay? So, Pentecost. Well, then, then we take a break and we go through summer and we end up in the fall. And what are the three fall feasts? Trumpets. Feast of Trumpets. That's the first one. Now, keeping in mind, we believe that the first three feasts have been fulfilled in the ministry of Jesus Christ and with the coming of the Holy Spirit. So now we're looking to the Feast of Trumpets, that sound which will be given. Uh, <coughs> Paul writes and, and other writers talk about when, when Jesus comes again, it will be with a loud voice, with the sound of a trumpet. Okay, what's the next one? Yom Kippur, Day of Atonement, the highest holy day of the year. This is where the high priest would go in and make sacrifice for all the sins of the nation. Okay? And then after Yom Kippur is? Booths. Booths, Feast of Tabernacles. This was to remind people that God delivered them. He took them out of Egypt and they spent time in the desert going, living in tabernacles. It also reminded them that God Himself dwelt in a tabernacle. Okay? So we see these three are yet to be completely filled. Okay? So let's dive in to the Sabbath. <clears throat> what, does, what does Sabbath mean? Intermission. Intermission. Arrest. Break. We see the institution of the Sabbath in Genesis. God created. In six days He created everything. On the seventh, He rested. It was not because God was tired. It wasn't because God was just exhausted. Oh gosh, I mean, I created all of those animals. I didn't even have energy to name them. I had to create somebody to name them. I'm pooped. That wasn't what happened. God was stepping back and he was ceasing from that particular toil. Okay? It doesn't mean he was wiped out, he was exhausted. He was instituting something that would be played out in our lives because of the way he created us. Remember Imago Dei. We are created in the image of God. And so we are an echo of God. Okay? Now, keep in mind, please, sin has corrupted that. Sin is, has besmirched the image of God in our lives. But God knew how He made us. He knew best how we would function. And so we see this implementation that God rested on the seventh day. We don't hear about this again until years down the road. Okay? Everybody, Noah's come and gone and, and the, the flood and, and the, the nations are dispersed and then uh, we see this man... Uh, called Abram that God particularly calls out of the nations and, and brings him to Canaan and, and promise to give him the land and then, then Abram has a son, actually has two sons and then his son uh, um, Isaac, Isaac I, I kept wanting to say Esau and I knew it wasn't Esau Isaac is, is again the promise is given to Isaac, what I promised to your father will be given to you he has two sons Jacob uh, is the inheritor of the promise that was from Abraham to Isaac. It's given to Jacob. And, and then Jacob has 12 sons. I don't know why the difference, but he has 12. Okay, and then we see the captivity in Egypt. And then 400 years later, God brings them out. Now, when God brings them out, he's bringing out a people his very own. Okay, and it's interesting. If you look back through the scriptures... Um, it takes a personal encounter with God for him to be your own. Because when Isaac was a son of Abraham, he referred often to God as the God of my father Abraham. But when Isaac had an encounter with God, he called him his God. 
And Jacob, he calls God the, father, the, the God of my father Abraham and Isaac. But then when he has an encounter with God, he calls him my God. Okay? So then we see this, this period. They're drawing, God is drawing the people out of Egypt. They had become an incredibly great nation unto themselves such that Egypt was concerned. There's too many of them. If they should rise up against us, we're in trouble. So there's a Pharaoh enslaves the people. God hears the people's cry and he delivers them. And he takes them out and he sets in motion a plan to fulfill the promise that he gave to Abraham 500 years before. Okay? And he takes them out into the desert and he takes them up to the holy mountain and, and he gives them his commandments. Alright? So right here we see the institution of the Sabbath for the Jewish people, for the Israelites. In Exodus chapter 16, I'm just going to rush over this real quick because I want to get into the end of this. Don't, don't flip there yet, okay? Exodus 16, uh, God speaks to Moses. Moses speaks to the Israel, says, uh, they're talking about the manna, says, eat it today for today is a Sabbath to the Lord. Today you will not find it in the field. Six days you will gather it, but on the seventh day, which is a Sabbath, there will be none. The seventh day, which is an intermission, which is a break, there won't be any. So God is giving them manna. They go out, they collect it. And on the sixth day, they were to collect twice as much because on the Sabbath, they were not to do work. Okay? So then a little bit later in Exodus, we see that God is giving them the commands. Um, Exodus chapter 20, he says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But on the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord God. On it you shall not do any work. Okay? So we see now that the Sabbath rest that God has designed for us is, is being made holy. Now, we talked a little bit about churchy words. Okay? So when, when we say Sabbath... Um, we have this idea in our head of a religious ceremony, uh, a, a kind of uh, s something religious. Well, God just means it's a rest. It's a day to rest. And when we say holy, you hear choirs sing and, and light shining. And, and what, what holy means is separate. Okay, so when, when God says that he is a holy God, it means that he's unique and separate from everything else. Okay, And when he calls us a holy people, he's calling us a holy people because he has separated us out to be like him, not like them. We're not to be like the world. That's why we're a holy people. So when he says it's a holy day, it's a day separated for rest. It's an intermission day. Now, we talked a little bit about how we went from that to Jesus' day. And how the Jews had taken this law and they, they set this establishment. Well, if this is where the line is, this is the threshold that we cannot cross, we should make another line here just to be safe. And then after a period of time, the Jews looked and they said, well, you know, if that line there is keeping us safe, wouldn't it be wise to have a line here? And all of a sudden, we have dozens, hundreds of laws that are being given to define one command. One command. We know that uh, the Jews also looked at the writings of their predecessors, their rabbis, and they gave them a greater credibility, a greater credence than they did the very words of God spoken through Moses. Yeah, Moses' words were good, were, but this guy really understood what Moses meant. And so, you know, Moses just gave us the, the, the nucleus of the thing, but really all of these other teachers have taught us so much more. And this is why we see in the life of Jesus, the Pharisees are coming to him and the, the, the religious leaders are coming to him and saying, hey, why are you violating the Sabbath? Well, that gives us a dilemma. Because if Jesus, being born of God, faced every temptation that we have faced, and yet did not sin, was he violating the Sabbath? Well, no, of course not. We see on two occasions that the religious leaders came down on him 
for violating the Sabbath. The first one, and this actually happened several times, this is a case, is Jesus healed on the Sabbath. Wow. They're offended. I'll bet you if he had healed them, their offense would not have been so great. But remember the man with the withered hand? And Jesus said, stretch it out, and it became as good as the other. And the leaders are upset. I, I, I don't know about you, but to me that's miraculous. And that doesn't fall under the, the idea of man working, because if Jesus were just a man, how could he have done that? Okay? Okay. So they come down on him and, and Jesus actually argues with them from the scripture. He says, well, which one of you, if, if you have a, a, a sheep that falls into a pit, will you not draw him out and violate the Sabbath in doing so? And, and in another place, he actually talks about it. He says, why are you so concerned about the conditions of your fathers and you forget the word of our God? Because then we see another example. The, the disciples and Jesus are walking through a field. The disciples are hungry. They pluck some heads of grain. And they eat it. <gasps> Are you violating the Sabbath? So, the question is, who was right? Because remember, Jesus said that the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So we need to have a mindset about this because there are a lot of teachings out there. There are a lot of... of uh, <clears throat> we'll just leave it at teachings out there that talk about not violating the Sabbath. Um, the Sabbath, which, which day of the week, I'm going to backtrack here, which day of the week is the Sabbath? Saturday. Saturday okay? The, the Jewish calendar moves from Sunday as the first day of the week, wraps around to Saturday. For whatever reason in our Western culture, we think Monday tends to be the first day of the week because that's, that's where hell starts. <laughs> That's where we got to jump back into all the stuff we don't like and work through to Saturday and Sunday. But, but the, the, the clock actually starts Sunday, and, and technically it actually starts at 6 o'clock Saturday evening because they follow the, the, the daily calendar as set up by God in Genesis. He says there was evening and then there was day the first day or the second day. Okay, So they start 6 o'clock on Saturday, going to 6 o'clock Sunday is the first day. And, and so backing that up, the last day would then be Saturday, which would begin at 6 o'clock on Friday and go to 6 o'clock evening Saturday. So they have this day in which you are to do no regular work. You're not supposed to work. Um, <clears throat> so this being the case, Jesus is, is confronted with the Pharisees and the teachers of the law and, and the scribes and those whose, whose life their, their very lives are all about knowing the law. Okay? So, Jesus, being God, had a better understanding of what the Sabbath was really all about. And when God established it, God knew that His creation was designed such that six days' work was sufficient. And that on the seventh, there should be a day of rest. Okay? So, was Jesus violating the Sabbath? Simply put, no. Because we know from Scripture that Jesus went to the cross absolutely perfect, absolutely holy. So he could not have violated his own law in any way. So where's the dilemma? The dilemma comes in because the Pharisees had made the Sabbath something God did not intend. Okay? Um, <clears throat> Roger was sharing with me a story before service that I think illustrates this, this very accurately. Um, he was telling me that, was it, was it somebody that you knew? Okay, there was a, a Jewish man that had a store, and he had a Christian employee. And on Saturday, the store was opened, and he was at the store, but he would not handle the money. She had to do all the transactions. And at one point, she needed him to make change, and he wouldn't touch the money because that would be considered work. Okay? And, and there were all of these laws that were developed to protect them from violating 
what God had told them not to violate. And, and all of a sudden, you know, holding your child on the Sabbath was not an issue unless your child was holding a rock. And that's a no-no. You don't do that. You could, they, they would measure the steps from your house to the synagogue, and that was a Sabbath day's journey. That's as far as you could go on the Sabbath, from there to the synagogue and back. That was your Sabbath day's journey. Okay? So all of these things were implemented to protect them from violating the law. Now, I believe absolutely that in their hearts they were trying to honor God, but they violated God's command because God said, this is my law, do not add a word to it, do not take a word from it. And all of a sudden, just one command has hundreds of rules being added to it. Okay? So we see that even though their intentions were good, they got off track. And they, they actually violated another law in their attempts to keep this one. So, getting into where we're at today. We've talked a little bit about Jesus. We know that Jesus had no intention of violating the law. In uh, Matthew chapter 5, the Sermon on the Mount, um, verses 17 and 18, Jesus is speaking. He says, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. When he says the law or the prophets, he said, he's saying the Hebrew Bible. Okay? Genesis to Malachi. Okay? Uh, the Torah, the law as given by Moses and the prophets, and, and all of those are together. When, when they say the law and the prophets are talking about the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, okay? So it's not like he, there's certain parts of it that they're looking at. They're looking at the whole thing. So he says, I have not come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Hold on to that, okay? I've not come to get rid of them. I've come to fulfill them. You need to keep that in your mind because it's very significant in how this whole thing plays out. He says, for truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Okay. So if Jesus came not to abolish the law, but to fulfill it, and not one of it's going to pass away, why are we meeting today instead of yesterday? Why are we not celebrating the Sabbath as was laid out for the Jews in Exodus and, and uh, Leviticus and in Deuteronomy. What, what, are we being audacious? Or are we in some manner violating the law that God has given us? Well, if things were left at that point, yes. But thank God, things were not left at that point. Because if it had stopped there... I doubt very many of us... Do we have anybody in here that is Jewish? Anybody that has, has a Jewish blood in your veins? I, I got a little tiny bit. I don't know where it came from, but that's what they tell me. I got a little tiny bit. Um, any, okay, so chances are none of us would be in the boat. We'd all still be out drowning. Okay? And, and, and there would be a select few in the boat that would be waving at us, Oh! and then taking the paddle and whacking us over the head so we couldn't get in the boat. Okay? Which is exactly opposite to what God intended for that people to do because He intended them to be a light to the world. That through them, He might reach the world, that He might bless the world, that He might bring the world back to Him. Okay? So, by the way, are you one of those in the boat that, that's yelling for people and hitting them on the head with your oar? Or are you one of the ones that's reaching down helping them get up into the boat? Okay? Or, or are you just sitting in the middle thanking God that you're not in the water anymore? <laughs> so, why are we here and not on Saturday? Turn to uh, John chapter 19. Very cool little statement that Jesus says. <clears throat> John chapter 19. It 
so, just to kind of set this up, Jesus has been arrested, he's been tried, he's been beaten, he's been scourged, he's the crown of thorns, all of that has happened. He's on the cross. Okay? A number of things have transpired up to this point, but right here, verse 28, this is where I want us to pick up. Okay? Because nothing in God's Word is there by accident. Everything in there is significant. We need to remember that. We may not understand the significance, but it's in there for a reason. Okay? So verse 28. After this, after all of these things had happened, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said, to fulfill the Scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. It is accomplished. It's done. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Okay, now, there was a huge period in between the first verse that we read in Matthew chapter 5 and what we just read in John. There's three plus years that are going on in there that things happened and Jesus ministered on the earth that he proved not only his, his lineage but he proved his authority. He proved that he was not only the son of man but he was also the son of God. And, and he did all the things that were prophesied about his first advent, his first coming. Okay. The whole purpose of his first advent was to deal with sin. Okay. Was to bridge the gap between sinful man and a holy God. So the first advent was all geared to that. So he establishes right off at the start of his ministry what his purpose is. He says, until all has been fulfilled, not one part of it is going to fall away. And right here, it says, knowing that all was now finished, and then he says, it is finished. You go, okay, well, how does that apply to the Sabbath? Well, first we understand that Jesus never violated the Sabbath. So when we look at the things that he did all throughout his ministry, pay attention how many times on the Sabbath it was mentioned that he was doing things. He was about his father's work. He was teaching in the synagogues. He was, he was doing what he was called to do, but he never violated the Sabbath. Okay, Because at one and the same time, he is God who instituted the Sabbath. He is also man who is honoring the Sabbath. Okay, So Jesus says, it is finished. It has been fulfilled. It has been accomplished. The, the issue with sin has been dealt with. One of the things that we so often get caught up in is that, that you know, the devil likes to tell us that we're not worthy, that you know, we're never going to have victory. Why would God want us? We're, we're always fa failing. We're always stumbling. We're always caught up in this sin or that sin. and We're not worthy. Yes. In and of ourselves, we are not worthy. That is what makes His sacrifice so awesome. That is what makes what He did so incredible, so amazing. That We sing the song Amazing Grace and sometimes I think we fail to connect the significance of that phrase. Amazing, absolutely astounding. Beyond any expectation, grace. He gave me what I did not deserve. So when, when I come before Him, I have a lot of baggage. I'm not talking about my weight. I'm talking about the stuff that goes on in my brain, the things that come out of my mouth, the distractions. Um, <clears throat> Steve, could you get me the hymn that we sung this morning? Would you pull that for me real quick? Um, when I come before Him, if that's how I stand before Him, if that's how He sees me, I'm in trouble. It doesn't matter before God how I compare to you. Okay? Because he's not saying, all right, um, who am I going to pick on? <laughs> Deb, stand up. <laughs> this Deb. <laughs> Why are you looking at Richard? <laughs> Come here. Thank you. Come on. 
Come here, come here, come here. Okay, so we're going to stand before God, and He's going to look at Deb, and He's going to tally it up. And then He's going to look at me, and He's going to tally it up. And He's going to say, well, you know, if you were a little more like Deb, you'd be all right, but... but no, you're, you're not. Don't get cocky because Richard's standing on the other side of you and he's got less tallies than you. Thank you. Okay, so, but is that what happens? But isn't that what we do? Isn't that what we do? We, we try to compare ourselves to people and it goes both ways. We go, oh, man, if I could only be like that person. Man, they've got just such an incredible walk. They've got such intimacy with God. They've got a connection. I want that. That's not necessarily a bad thing until it brings condemnation. Condemnation does not come from God. Conviction comes from God. He sent His Spirit to convict us of sin. Why? Because the conviction brings about a desire to get it addressed, to get it dealt with. Okay? It's for our good. You know, Scripture says in Hebrews that, that no one enjoys discipline. It, it, it stinks in the moment. But it's for a better cause. It's for a good reason. Okay? But then we also compare ourselves to the others. You know, I may not be as good as this person. Man, I'm so glad I'm not that person. That person's hosed. Man, when they stand before God, I want them next to me so I look good. Okay? We're going to get up before God and I'm going to be checking out. All right, I need you and you come, you're on either side of me. All right? That's not how it's going to work. Because what are we going to be compared to? Jesus. We're going to be compared to perfection. We're going to be compared to the measure that is unattainable of ourselves. Okay? So, when we stand before God, He is going to look at us in light of Christ. Now, thank God, because this is what's so amazing about grace. Because when I stand before Him, He looks through the veil of Christ's blood to see me. And when He looks at me, He sees His righteousness in me. And those sins that I've committed, those are dealt with. The price has been paid. Jesus said it's finished. The price is paid. Everything is done. So when I stand before him and the devil's standing there as the accuser, you did this, you did this. Remember when you thought that? Oh yeah, I heard that. And, and remember when you're driving down the road and, and that farmer pulled in front of you going two miles an hour with his big tractor? Uh-huh. Yeah. You needed to go to repent, buddy. You're out. You're out. And you know what? I can say absolutely. Every, every bit of that is true. Every bit of that is true. But I don't trust in my works. I trust in the grace of God. Amen. Okay? So, Jesus never violated the Sabbath. But how does that deal with this? I want to, I want to, when we were singing this song, Come Thou Font, I love this last verse. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor. Daily, I'm constrained to be. Just think about that line for just a minute. I owe everything to grace. You know, religion, if you look up religion in the dictionary, it will carry some connotation of binding yourself to a set of ideals. We, we look at religion and a lot of times we go, oh, no, no, I'm not religious, I'm a Christian. <laughs> because when you, you become religious, you, you get this idea that somehow or another your works are, are good enough. But the, but the root of religion is to bind yourself to a set of ideals. And if we can bind ourselves to this, that His grace, I owe so much to His grace. Let thy goodness, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. You know, Paul uses the, the example of the bondservant. See, we don't get to choose whether or not we're going to be a servant, a slave. We just choose who our master will be. Okay, because everybody's a slave to something. And, and the Jewish custom in the day was that after you, you were a slave and your, your time of remit was up, and, and whether it be the year of Jubilee or you paid back all that you owed, you could choose at your discretion, not the owner's discretion, at your discretion, to willingly continue that service, okay, to be a bond servant, doulos, okay, and and the the sign of this was they would take your ear and they put it up on the door jam and they take an awl and put it through your ear, and then they would usually put a ring in it 
to symbolize that you have chosen to serve. Okay? Let thy goodness like a fetter bind my wandering heart to thee. God, God lock it in. Prone to wander. Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Now, I know, you know, when, when we, my first thought when I read that is, you know, we're, we, we all have a tendency to sin. We have, all have these patterns of behavior that have been established in our life that, that lead to sin. Okay? But, but I think this is bigger than that because we get so busy. We, we get so caught up in the things that are going on that how much time in a day are we not where God wants us to be? Our, our minds are not where they should be. Our hearts are not where they should be. How, how often do we get caught up in this? We're wandering. Prone to wander. Prone to be distracted. Prone toward patterns of behavior. Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. One of the things that, that constantly amazes me, I've been asking God to make me aware when things like this happen. He's got to be exhausted by now. Because it happens so frequently. Where I will get caught up in something that's going on, and before I know it, I'm not thinking about God. My heart is not there. I have not set my mind on those things above. Here's my heart, Lord. Take and seal it. Take my heart. Seal it under yourself. Put that stamp on it. The Holy Spirit that says before all of creation, I am yours. Seal it. I, I love this, this, this verse. I, I just think it speaks in, in such beautiful prose to the, the condition that we tend to operate in. Thank you guys for choosing that this morning. That was awesome. All right, so, back to the Sabbath. What about Paul? Jesus said it's finished. Jesus never missed the Sabbath. Uh, I gave you a little bit of homework or a challenge last week to look through the book of Acts. Um, we see in the life of Paul that when he was first called to minister, yes? When they crucified him, they did it on the Sabbath. Right? They did it before the Sabbath. The Sabbath would have been at sundown that night. So they had to take him off That's the cross. That's why he had to be off the cross before the sun before went down. Before the Sabbath. Yep, and had to be prepped and in the tomb. it was also a very high Sabbath. It was on one yes, it was. Year. Yes, it was. So that's pretty significant. It, it's hugely significant. When we get into the feast, you're going to just see how significant. Because God didn't put anything in there on accident. Everything is moving according to a plan. So... In the book of Acts, we see Saul persecuting the church. He is, is complicit in the stoning of Stephen. He takes the road to Damascus. He encounters God. Jesus appears before him, speaks to him, tells him... Now, see, this is why he's God and I'm not. <clears throat> because if that had been me, there would have been the blinding light, there would have been a sound of thunder, and there would have been a, a dust pile where Paul was. Done. Moving on to the next one. But God, knowing all things, knew just how incredible a person that Paul could be if he would turn his heart. And instead of working against Christ, working against God's work, he would work with it. That's one of those things that I watch my grandkids. There are certain things that I pray over each of my grandkids according to their bent, according to their personality. There are some that I pray, God, they... God has blessed us with very strong-willed grandchildren. We do not have any easygoing grandchildren. We don't have any that don't, man, I want it my way. And I pray certain things over because I can see how if God can take a hold of that and He could mold that and shape that, how they could make an impact on this world far beyond anything I would ever hope for. Incredible. And so my prayer is that God will take of them and He will make a generation of them mighty unto His name. Okay? So Paul, being this type of person, God didn't want to just destroy him. He wanted to use him. And we see that as, as Paul, uh, being a Jew, celebrating the Sabbath, according to the law, blameless, is how he describes himself. According to the law, blameless. 
Okay? And when, when the church sends them out, him and Barnabas from Antioch, they, they go out on their missionary journey. Where do they start to teach? In the synagogues. I asked you to look through the book of Acts and to start paying attention to the Sabbaths between chapter 1 and chapter 18. Uh, depending on your translation, because I did find one other, there's eight uses of the Sabbath. And, and one other translation, th there's nine, but I'm not convinced that that's really the Sabbath. Okay, Because one of the things that I've found is in the church's attempt to disregard the Jewishness of our faith, we have associated the Lord's Day with the Sabbath. And those are two very different things. Okay? So, we see eight times. So, if you have your Bible, turn with me over to chapter 18 in the book of Acts. He has met Aquila, or Aquila, and his wife Priscilla. Um, they're talking about the emperor Claudius that, that commanded the Jews to leave Rome. See, this is what's so incredible about Luke's writing. He puts in external references to what's going on internal to the story of the Bible, to the story of the gospel, to the story of the church. And so he gives us these key indicators that we can look at, and we say, okay, that the emperor was Claudius, and he commanded the Jews to leave Rome. So we can look back historically and see at what point in time this actually happened. And this gives further credibility to his writing. Okay? Um, and, and Paul went to see them, uh, verse 3, and because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, and they were tent makers by trade. Um, there's a, an actually very good line of thought that the tent maker there was not actually building a tent like a tabernacle or a camping tent, but it was the tallit that, that they would wear as their, their prayer covering. They, they made those. Um, don't know. Uh, sounds good. Yeah, I'm okay with that. Doesn't really change anything. Uh, verse 4, And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade the Jews and Greeks. Now, if you look at the history of Paul, Whenever he came into the city, the first place he headed for was the synagogue. Okay? And he ministered in the synagogue until such a time <laughs> that he had to run. Okay? So, verse 5, when Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul was occupied with the word, testifying to the Jews that the Christ was Jesus. Now, we, a lot of times we look at Jesus Christ as a first name and a last name, or a first name and a middle name. Christ is the Greek word, Christos, that is the equivalent of Messiah, okay? The, the anointed one. So when he says that the Christ, he's saying the anointed one, capital A, the one that was promised, and then Jesus being the person, okay? Verse 6, And when they opposed and reviled him, he shook out his garments and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. Okay? Now, right here in those verses, we see a key turning point in the Scripture, in the history of the church. Okay? Now, keeping in mind, when God first spoke to Saul, he told him that he was going to anoint him and he was going to make him to be an apostle to the Gentiles. Now this is more than 14 years later. Okay, We know that from the book of, of Galatians, the first chapter of Galatians. So we know a, a lengthy period of time has happened. We know that God had already spoken to Peter and, and the vision of the, the sheep coming down with all the food and God said, don't call anything impure that I have made pure. So we know that God's heart is that moving forward through the Jews, from Judea, Jerusalem, Judea, to Samaria, to the uttermost parts of the world. He wants the gospel to go out. Okay? So, but here at the point, in 18, because up to this point, eight or nine times the word Sabbath is used. 
After this, you will not see it again in Scripture except in two cases. One, where the apostle is actually defending the position what day you should worship. And, and the other is a reference again back to that. But, but you never see again that, that they're talking about worshiping on the Sabbath. Now, now, keep this in mind, that the early church was Jewish. They probably never stopped worshiping on the Sabbath. As a matter of fact, we see um, in Christ, everything is magnified, not eliminated. We see in the Old Testament, these are the sins, don't do them. But then in the New Testament, Jesus makes us aware that sin is a problem with the heart. It begins in your processes here, and only it gets to action after it's been conceived in your heart. Okay? And he says, sin isn't so much the adultery, it's looking lustfully. Sin isn't so much murder as it is hatred. It, it, it springs forth from something. It doesn't just come into existence of its own. So he has taken the problem of, of the law and he's made us aware, oh great! Not only am I not allowed to do these things, I can't even think of them. Man! Okay, but then he also addresses the issue of, of fulfilling that so that we could stand before God in righteousness of, of all of our sin, not just our actions, but also our thoughts. But, but look at this thing. He also does the same thing with the Sabbath. Um, <clears throat> in, earlier in Acts, um, chapter, I believe it's 3. Hang on a second. I'm going to get there and look it up real quick. Um, Okay, uh, verse 46. This is another reason why we believe that Pentecost happened at the temple. Verse 46, the church has just been established. This is at the end of the salvation of 3,000, which is an echo, a fulfillment of an Old Testament story. Um, verse 46, it says, And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. They were meeting together not only on the Sabbath, but when? Every day. Every day. Every single one of them, they were meeting together. Every day. Because what God was doing was He was making us aware that every single day is holy. Because He's in all of them. They're all His. I, I, I get so frustrated. I, it's, it's Halloween. we got Halloween coming up. October 31st. And I, I, all of these people, oh, historically, that was a day that was given unto the devil and the festival of Samhain. And, and this is when the witches would come out and the druids would come out and the demons would come out and everybody would be ugly and all of these things. And we're celebrating that. Listen, folks, it was God's day first. Amen. The devil stole it. The church took it back. Oh, Jesus wasn't born on Christmas. He was probably born in September. And we're just celebrating. We've, we've taken another pagan holiday. They weren't theirs to begin with. They were ours. Because every one of them was God's. The devil ain't big enough to take those from God. They're his. He declares them to be his. So we have a right on every cotton-picking day to declare it to be God's. I don't care what the world does. They're lost. Now I will say this. Be careful how you celebrate. Be careful how you celebrate. Be careful what you're celebrating. Okay? Be careful what you celebrate. Okay? You go into October 31st dressing up like witches and goblins and ghouls and, and celebrating the horror of the demonic world. You're not celebrating God. I don't care if you dress up. Dress appropriately. Celebrate. <clears throat> Do, there's, there's nothing wrong with costumes. But what are you trying to tell? What, remember, right now in this moment, you are an ambassador for Christ before the world. And when you go out looking like the demonic stuff in this world, how good of an ambassador can you really be? I, I guess you could try to scare the hell out of people. <laughs> but that's about as good as it gets. All right? So, at this point, the story changes. Now, 
We see from here on out throughout Scripture. <coughs> I'm going to wrap this up real quick. There's two things I want to say real quick. Um, Colossians chapter 2, verse 16 and 17. Therefore, that no one pass judgment on you in question of food and drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. These are shadows of the things to come. But the substance belongs to Christ. See, that's it right there. They're all His. They're all His. Romans chapter 14. One person esteems one day as better than another, while another esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. The one who observes the day observes it in honor of the Lord. And then we go on. He's kind of circling back to his original statement. The one who eats, eats in honor of the Lord, since he gives thanks to God. While the one who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord and gives thanks to God. Okay? Look, we can't look at those that celebrate on Saturday and say, you poor ignorant fools. Because... Who are we giving an account to? That They've got their own master that they give account to. And they, by the same token, they can't look at us and say, oh, you poor fools. I, honestly, I believe in my heart that's where the uh, Seventh-day Adventists have crossed the line from being an aberration to, to being a cult. Because they now have written in their doctrinal statement as a church that the mark of the beast is worshiping God on Sunday. And, and I believe that flies in the face of what we see as Scripture. Okay. The Lord's Day is Sunday. That's the day He rose from the dead. And the church took that day and they celebrated on it. As a matter of fact, we see several examples throughout the rest of the New Testament where it says they were meeting together on the Lord's Day, the first day of the week. Okay. One other point that I want to make real quick. Um, Council of Jerusalem. There was a, a problem in the church because the, the church started off with the Jews. And all of a sudden, they're getting flooded with all of these Gentiles that are coming in. And, and there's this, this problem because what, what are the expectations of them? You know, the Judaizers, the, the reason the book of Galatians was written was because so many Jews were trying to compound salvation with an ability to meet all the requirements of Moses, the Mosaic Law. It's not Moses' requirements, it's God's requirements, but given through Moses. And so they're, they're telling him, hey, you know, first thing, snippy, snippy. <laughs> then after that, you got to start keeping all of the commands. And, and, and which of these commands are they supposed to keep? And, and we, we know the teaching of Jesus was, was that, that all of these extra things are, 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 are a burden added on to man. But how do we do this? So they had this council and all of the church leaders came together in Jerusalem. And they, they, they bore testimony, hey man, God's in this. Every sign that he gave us when we got saved, he's given them. So how can we deny that it's him? And so they came up with a conclusion. There were a number of things that they addressed to the new believers. Um, so um, these are the four things. This is in Acts chapter 15. One, to abstain from things polluted by idols. Two, to abstain from sexual immorality. Three, to abstain from from strangled animals, and some people combine three and four together, and from blood. Okay, so some people say that, that the Gentile belief was the strangling of the animal, they eat the meat with the blood still in it. So that was actually one thing. But, but for our purposes, we're just going to say the, there's four. Okay, those were the four directives that they gave to the Gentile converts to the faith. Do you notice what's missing there? Sabbath. They don't tell them to keep the Sabbath. The, these new converts that are coming in, they don't tell them, hey, you, you, Saturday's the day, but you know, if you're not celebrating on Saturday, if you're, you're doing work on Saturday, you're out. It's not even addressed. Okay? So, the first feast being Sabbath, one day a week, God sets it aside, says this is holy, this is a time to rest. It's a principle I honestly believe that you need to take one day a week and rest. <clears throat> what does that rest look like? My rest looks radically different from Christie's rest. I get impatient if I have to sit still for too long and, and not have something going on in my brain. Christie loves to just sit and stare out at I don't know what. <laughs> that, that to her is restful. That's not restful to me. That's, that, that, that's nothing to revitalize and re-energize me. 
Okay. okay. So, so rest is going to look different. But what I believe is that you cannot work seven days a week. It might prosper you in your wallet, but it's going to leave you at a, a serious debt in your soul. Okay. So the Sabbath, if it's implemented by God as a holy day, we are to treat all days as holy. Because they're all His. In the, the, the transition of things from, from pre-cross to post-cross, we see that everything belongs to Him. And we are to treat all days as holy. So when we come together on Sunday and somebody comes to you and says, Oh, don't you know you're supposed to? That's not the Sabbath. Yeah, that's okay. That's okay. We can take that and, and make it a Sabbath because what does Sabbath mean? Intermission. Intermission. A break. A rest. I'm okay with that. You okay with that? All right. Any questions? Come talk to me afterwards. Father, we bless you today and we thank you. Because you know us full well. You know our need. You know how you've designed us. You have brought us to you. Father, that we might be inheritors of your grace and your mercy. That we might be recipients of your favor. I ask, Father, this morning, if there is anyone here that doesn't know you today, that your spirit would draw them, your spirit would woo them. That, Father, you would be the answer to all of the questions that we have. That, Father, new life might be found in you. I ask, Father, for the believers that are here today, that you would strengthen them, that you would encourage them, that, Father, you would set before them your plans and your purposes, that, Father, you would give them all that they need, that they would strive, that we would strive, that we would run this race with endurance, pressing on as though to win the prize. Father, that when we cross that finish line and we run right into your arms, you would say, well done. I thank you, Father, for your word. And we bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.